Hi, this is Josh Beiser from GameWisdom.com. Hope you enjoyed this critical thought, a detailed discussion on game design, and be sure to subscribe and you can pitch future critical thought topics. Alright everybody, for today's critical thought, we're going to be getting to a little bit of philosophy when it comes to game design. And I want to talk about what's considered the beauty and the absolute nightmare when it comes to game development. This is going to be based on some conversations I've had with developers and a post on Game Wisdom, which I'll link to below when it goes up, which should be within a few hours of this video being posted on YouTube. Anyway, when it comes to game design, as we've talked about before, and this is part of the presentation that I gave a few months ago, game design is a very wide term in terms of what it represents. And making a good game, or understanding what it means to make a good game, really relies on a variety of soft skills rather than hard. Now, you don't know the difference. Hard skills are something that can be easily taught. Um, woodworking, how to drive, uh, how to hold paintbrush, use chopsticks, anything like that. Soft skills are those that are a little bit harder to qualify. And they are also hard to represent in terms of teaching. Stuff like um, how to be more confident at work, please your wife in 10 easy steps, <laughs> crazy stuff like that. But when it comes to game design, something that I've heard from a lot of developers is that there is no magic checklist or set of instructions that will make your game perfect. And one of the most amazing things about game development is that it's very much a combination of art and science. As we've talked about before, making a video game relies on many different disciplines. And we can talk about things, again, in any, no, any one of these categories could easily be several videos worth of topics. From understanding how to program, how to work in a game engine, designing 2D or 3D models, sound design, the PR side, managing your team, and we can keep going on. And a lot of those skills are considered hard. You can go to school to learn how to program. You can go to an art skill or art school to learn how to do models, uh, the hand touch, computer generated graphics, etc. But, and this is where things get very interesting, there are no set of skills that relate specifically to game design in the sense of being able to tell what makes a game good or bad. How do you design an amazing platformer? How do you make a sufficiently well-paced horror game? And one of the things that I've spoken to a lot of developers about, and one of the things that they loved, is the fact that there is no hard guidelines when it comes to game design. We can certainly have that ever-popular discussion about what is or what isn't a video game. But at the end of the day, when it comes to designing a game, it's basically you have your entire imagination open to you. Now, there are a few exceptions to this rule. Obviously, when we're talking about specific genres, there are hard elements to them. If you're going to do a first-person shooter, the camera has to be in first person. First person, there you go. If it's a strategy game, you need to represent those elements. But other than those rare exceptions, anything and everything is on the table. In the post, I talked about things from a platformer point of view. And we can talk about pure platformers like Mario, Super Meat Boy, but then we can get very interesting. What about a platformer that's about a high-speed movement while you're in the air, such as Dust Force? How about a platform where you don't even jump and it's based on gravity like VVVVVV? Or something like Bio Commando, where it's having a jump button, you grapple around using these ceiling walls and so on. The point is that when it comes to video game design and think about things in that point of view, it's very much a very, I'm not sure what the exact word I want to use, amorphous uh, kind of design in the sense that Again, there is no easy way to define what makes a game good or bad. We can talk about programming. We can say, you know, if your game crashes when you hit start, somebody messed up when it came to the code. You can talk about models looking off-tiltered or, you know, a character where his eye maybe, like, clips up into his head, stuff like that. 
but it's very hard to put a finger on what makes a game good or bad, and more importantly, what it takes to understand game design. It's one of the reasons why I love doing the stuff on game wisdom, and why these critical thoughts and industry insight vlogs are so fascinating. Because you really don't get to have these conversations all that often. Now I get to, I guess I get to have them more than most people thanks to talking to developers on a semi-regular basis. But one of the things that I've heard from many developers after these podcasts is that they always love them by the fact that they never get a chance to talk about it. And that's one of the very interesting things about game design, is the fact that there, again, there is no set of hard skills or a class that will teach you how to make a good game. You can be taught how to make sure your programming is good, you can be taught to make sure your art looks clean, but again, how can you be taught to make a well-paced game? Or how to use specific progression models to keep people coming back? And that's where things get very interesting, and back to the nature of today's vlog, is that every game is different. And that's both the wonder and the nightmare of game development. Because every game is different, again, no one's going to, or most people shouldn't come up to you and say, how dare you didn't do so-and-so, you didn't make an RPG. Or, your game doesn't have this, then how is this a first-person shooter? And again, you are only as limited as you are by your creativity when it comes to game design. And this video or this vlog is also kind of a, I guess another counter to when people say that video games are the same as other programs. And as we talked about in the post and what we did on previous vlogs, is that video games are very much the intersection between entertainment and programming. The programming is very much on the hard skill side of things, while the entertainment is on the soft side. And again, when you look at any kind of program in the world, be it tax software, um, Adobe Premiere, or again, you can insert any program here, the program's task is not to entertain you. It's designed to do what it does, and you have to work with it. You're not going to see, um, I'm trying to think of some, oh, I know, you're not going to see Audacity give you an achievement for making sure that you normalize all your sound values correctly, or that you properly splice in an intro song. But video games have to entertain, and they also have to keep you invested in playing. And all those little things, and again, many of the topics we've talked about here on Game Wisdom and over here on the YouTube channel, have gone along with trying to shine a light on these elements. Be it stuff like talking about achievements, the right way to balance skills, loot tables, platformer design, UI design, control design, and again, I could sit here for another 15, 20 minutes, and we could name more topics. But getting to the other side of this, there, this is also presents the nightmare when it comes to game design. And that is, every genre is different, which means that you can't really translate the soft skills of game design from one genre to another. Again, a programmer, once you've learned how to completely build a game engine, you can certainly apply that Oh, excuse me, apply that to any number of games and any other, any number of programming based jobs. The same goes for art. If you're a good enough 2D or 3D artist, I'm sure you can find work outside the game industry. But when it comes to game design and the skills that go with making a well designed title, these skills aren't as easily transferable. And not even just transferable from the game industry to outside of it, but even within the game industry. And this is one of the things that we've talked about with the pressure or the allure of going big. And that is, just because you've made one amazing game, doesn't magically put you ahead if you move to another genre. Again, as I'm sure all of you know watching this, there's a very big difference between making a, a pixel hunting adventure game versus a third person shooter versus a visual novel RPG and again, we can just keep naming genres. And when we talked about the risks and dangers of going big, one of the easiest ways to put you in a risky, risky situation is going from a genre that you've known and you've become well adapted to, to then going, betting it all on a genre that you've never made one game in. 
And again, we've talked about examples of that in the past. But again, the point about this, and when we get into the philosophy, is that game design as a term is a very blanket statement and really encompasses a lot of smaller disciplines. It's the same thing about calling someone a craftsman or craftswoman. Do you do woodworking? Are you into metalworks, glass blowing, blacksmithing? Again, we can start naming things. And even with art, just because you're great at, uh, let's say, uh, postmodernism, postmodernism, there we go, doesn't automatically mean that you're going to be the best damn uh, cubist or cubism. And that's again where the art of game design comes into play, is that everything is different. And that means that you never know who's going to make what. As a very popular uh, analogy or a very popular thing that people that game designers say is that you should always be looking for inspiration everywhere when it comes to game design because you never know what's going to inspire you next. This is how we've seen this crazy mix-up of genres such as, of course, roguelikes with action elements, uh, Call of Duty with an RPG progression system, even the whole thing we did with Borderlands and role-playing shooters are an example of this. And again, goes back to the major topic of today, that every game is different. And I know we're getting a little bit more on the philosophy side for today, but it's always good to kind of sit back or take a step back and kind of examine things from the high-level point of view. But we're going to wrap things up for today, and I guess there's not much in terms of, I guess, questions for you folks, but I'm kind of curious to hear what you think about, again, the art and that kind of mystery of game design, especially for any developers watching this who have worked on different genres, as in your company started with platformers, then maybe you made a, a first-person exploration game. Or you went from RPGs to racing, and again, the anything and everything goes. But the final point I want to bring up is going back to what we were saying with going big. And that is you always have to be risky when switching to a genre that you have no experience with. Uh, as a quick example, if tomorrow Will Wright announces that he's working on a spiritual successor to SimCity, I'm going to throw money at that faster than you can say um, Earthquake in your downtown, uh, Earthquake in downtown. If Will Wright tomorrow announces that he's going to work on a first-person exploration horror game, I'm going to be a little bit more apprehensive about that, because I've never seen a first-person horror game from Will Wright. It could be the best example of that genre, or it could be a confusing mess. But therein lies the very big mystery when it comes to game design. That game design itself can be uh, split down or squared down into many different terms based on whatever genres and design senses that the person has. And like we said, you can have someone who specializes in progression systems, someone who understands RPG development, achievements, effective platforming design, effective first-person shooter weapons, and again, the list goes on. But typically, this is why, especially from the AAA market, once a studio has kind of carved out its specialty, it's very rare for it to, you know, go the complete opposite direction. But, with that said, thanks for watching, and I guess bearing with me while we get all philosophical today. If you're new, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel, and check back for daily discussions on game design here and on GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games. And if you have any suggestions for topics, be sure to let me know. But otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel, and of course share with your friends, it always helps out. For daily posts on all manner of game design and industry topics, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the site and everything that I do, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. If we can hit goals, it will mean more content for everyone to enjoy, and I'll be able to support myself and my household. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at GWBicer for updates throughout the day and random thoughts from me. And lastly, you can find me on Twitch right over there at 
GW Bicer for daily streams most nights around 10 Eastern. Thanks again for watching the video, and be sure to check out more great content coming to the Game Wisdom channel real soon.